Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 526 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 9th of January 2021 as I record this. In today's show I'm talking to Kate Champion about how it's never too late to achieve your goals, whether that's because of your age or your fear of technology or whether you feel like you're late to the indie world or any of these things. So that is coming up in the interview section. In publishing news, a report has just been released on COVID-19 and book publishing impacts and insights for 2021 from Thad McElroy at The Future of Publishing, who has been on the show, and two other co-writers. It's a 50-page report, which you can download for free, and uh, I'm going to give you some of the highlights. And I'm trying to laugh because things are pretty dark at the moment, which is that obviously COVID-19 is not over. And uh, But this is a look back at last year and the impacts and and what we might see this year. So it, it definitely acts as a sort of what else is going to be happening with publishing. So Thad says, Thad and the co-writers say, the big picture is positive with the pandemic increasing book sales for traditional publishers. And personally, and uh, from what I've heard from many indie authors, book sales have been very good. In fact, some authors have had their best year ever in 2020 in terms of book sales, at least. Let's forget about the rest of it. But at least a silver lining for publishing, at least so far. But the report does say COVID-19 has driven a huge shift in the retail environment from brick and mortar to online. This is impacting malls. And of course, this is an American report. Many countries don't have such significant malls as America. One estimate suggests that more than half of all mall-based department stores will close by the end of 2021. And actually, we are seeing department stores suffering here in the UK, but more like in our high street areas. And as shopping malls lose their anchor stores, buyers have few reasons to visit. A Moody's report estimates that 20% of all mall stores could close in five years. And of course, that's fine for a lot of independent booksellers. But Barnes & Noble is heavily dependent on healthy malls for many of its 600 plus locations. So that's interesting around the change in retail. But according to an Accenture report, customers are looking at small independent stores in their immediate neighbourhood as much love places that they fear won't survive, making an effort to support the retailers and their staff. So I think that's positive and that the support of independent booksellers, certainly we're doing that here in Bath. In terms of digital technology, the pandemic has accelerated the analog to digital evolution in every sense. And publishers are revisiting digital formats with new respect. An Accenture report says online retail has seen 10 years of growth in a matter of months. And this so this idea of years of growth in a matter of months is something that I've been reading about across a whole load of industries. That's why I've doubled down in this tech area as well, the AI area, because there has just been so much expansion that seriously things just happening every single day that seem to be massive. (laughs) So we are going to see more and more of this, I think, in 2021 as the things that people are starting to launch come to fruition. This is interesting around direct-to-consumer marketing, basically that publishers are now revisiting the idea of selling direct to customers rather than having to rely on brick-and-mortar booksellers and also the big companies that sit in the middle of publishers and customers. And this is interesting, as I've obviously been talking about this, doubling down on selling direct. And I heard this at the Future Book, certainly European booksellers building their own channels around direct-to-consumer. That is interesting because it's essentially a fragmentation of online sales market. And you, as a consumer, might... Because, so, for example, I only had one audiobooks app up until... I guess reasonably recently, so Find Away Voices, so I've got the Authors Direct app and now I've got the Book Funnel app, both of them. So I've now got three audio apps on my phone for audiobooks specifically. And then, of course, I have Spotify for music and podcasts, but that could well 
be audio books. I have Apple books, which and which can be used for audio books. So there are lots of different platforms that that you can read and listen on digitally. So maybe that's the way things are going. That we will people will increasingly be more loyal to the brand and will listen on whatever app is appropriate rather than just having one app. Who knows? This is really interesting that publishers are now talking about this. A question remains for libraries post-vaccine, post-COVID. Will there be a lingering distaste for handling shared physical objects and a reluctance to spend time in public spaces? I would say question mark. I'm looking forward to spending time in crowded public spaces. I don't know about you. Will this dampen demand for the return of more traditional library services? But of course, this means more potential for online library lending of ebooks and audiobooks. And of course, you can get your books into libraries in ebook, print, and audio if you publish wide in the various channels. Big gains in streaming media, as of course we've been talking about. The big winners are those with recurring revenue models who can bring a choice of different original pro- programming. And yes, as we as I've talked about in the last few weeks or so, uh, we're going to see more of this streaming this year. And again, if you own and control your intellectual property rights and you are not exclusive, and again, you get to choose, but if you are wide, you get to choose, yes, I'm going in with this and this as new models emerge. If you're exclusive, you do not have the choice to move into these other areas as they come. So yeah, just be, just watch out for the things you're signing and be aware of what you're choosing over time. And of course, with all of this, and I come back to this every single time, it's going to be the power of personal brand and the personal relationship and the way you can market direct to your customer that will make a difference. So for example, the reason I'm able to sell my ebooks and audiobooks direct to you and more of you are buying them every day, which is just brilliant at payhip.com forward slash the creative pen. The, the reason I can do that is because I have this podcast and I have my email newsletter, which is the, the two main ways that I can reach you and you listen or read and then you make a choice as to whether to buy directly from me or to buy on your other store. And of course, my books are all available on all these other stores anyway. This is going to be even more important with a fragmentation in a market. It's going to be, well, go to my website and there you'll find links to things or go to your favourite app and you'll be able to find the podcast or the book or whatever you want. So again, it always comes back to building that personal brand, building your email list, building a channel, a way to reach people. Okay, so Written Word Media have released the top 10 trends that every author needs to know for 2021. And a couple, again, lots of things that are similar to what I've been talking about, but they do say more traditional authors will move to the indie model, with especially with the coming merger of Penguin Random House and Simon and & Schuster. And also authors will see more success with international sales, quoting Ricardo Fayette from Reedsy, who is optimistic about the growth of the ebook market in Europe. Quote from Ricardo here, one thing the pandemic has greatly developed is the ebook market in European countries that so far viewed uh, that were so far viewed as extremely traditional in their book buying habits. Whatever the evolution of the pandemic, this trend will further develop, especially with all the Christmas present Kindle devices and other ebook devices. These new digital readers might not go back to print. Certainly someone like me, I read across ebooks, audiobooks and hardback and paperback books. So I think you become more of a hybrid reader, reading from different things with different preferences. And for example, with fiction, I only read digitally for fiction. And with nonfiction, I read with audio and hardback and paperback or whatever I can get there. And so this is really interesting. Ricardo does say authors willing to invest in trans translation could get a great foothold in this rising European market. And Ricardo says, I'd still recommend going for the German market first, but I feel the French, Italian and Spanish ones will catch up quickly. So I think this is interesting. I've, (laughs) again, always early. It was 2014 when I released my first German fiction self-published books. I invested in translation. I went that route. And yes, so probably... I would say at least five years early on that now is a much better time to be doing this. So I am certainly 
doubling down on the German nonfiction. If you remember back in November 2019, I did, I used DeepL.com AI translation engine to do the first draft. I worked with German editors, proofreaders, and those books in German, which are the only way I advertise them is by using Amazon auto ads. I literally just don't touch it. (laughs) I just let it run. Those books are profitable. So this year I am actually going to do some more German books. And uh, DeepL has improved their translation engine. In fact, in I think it was the beginning of 2020, they released an entirely new upgraded algorithm. And at the moment, I'm investigating the procedure for doing this. Where How different is that first draft? How much better is that first draft? So very interesting. You can also find translators if, from Reedsy. And uh, Ricardo's obviously from Reedsy. And Reedsy are increasingly a fantastic partner for indie authors. And you can use my link, if you like, at thecreativepen.com for Reedsy, R-E-E-D-S-Y. And yes, lots more on written word media about the top 10 publishing trends and of course as usual links in the show notes so in useful stuff this week it is online course tastic time (laughs) since we're all back home for the foreseeable few months at least there are some great online courses coming up and certainly if you're looking at improving your author life, your author income, and also your revenue this year, definitely consider some of these. So first up, Mark Dawson's Ads for Authors launches this week. It really is the best course on the market. I still, I've done Mark's Facebook ads module like three times or something because he does update it over time and all the modules are updated every year, really, approximately. And certainly they've got an Amazon ads module by an ex- Ex Amazon marketer and Facebook ads and a new module on BookBub ads, which and I basically at the moment my ad strategy is I use Amazon ads and Facebook for nonfiction. I use and for fiction I basically use BookBub ads for JF Pen and for Penny Appleton, my mum. I'm using Amazon ads and occasionally like free booksy and bargain booksy and stuff like that. So paid ads are essentially. <laughs> you can still market in other ways, of course, podcasting, content marketing, and I really use content marketing to underpin my whole business. But obviously, in a digital world, online paid ads are a really good way to reach people. And you definitely have to do some kind of marketing if you want to sell books. There are plenty of ways, obviously. But if you want to learn about ads, you can definitely save yourself time and you will save yourself money. Yes, courses are an investment. But if you you learn from experts, you are going to be able to shortcut the amount of time it takes you. So Mark has launched, relaunched the course or opened the course again this week. As I put this out on the 13th of January, you can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash ads, just ADS. So thecreativepen.com forward slash ads. And this is an evergreen link. So if you're listening later, it's going to go to the wait list. So highly recommend uh, Mark's course. And of course, remember, Mark is a seven figure fiction author and does have nonfiction books too, but certainly makes, <laughs> you know, a lot of money from his book sales because of his ad strategy. It's not just that he teaches courses on this. And I think that's very important. Also, uh, Teachable this week, and I use Teachable for all of my online courses. They have a webinar this week on how to create an online course that sells. You can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash teachable for the registration link. And again, it's an evergreen link for later on. So thecreativepen.com forward slash teachable. And I've also decided that if you want to take some online courses, I am offering now 50% off all my courses using the coupon lockdown. So (laughs) hopefully you can spell lockdown by now, (laughs) which is going to be valid for the whole of January and February. And I really hope we'll get out of lockdown in March. So just go to thecreativepen.com forward slash learn. Use coupon lockdown for 50% off any of my courses, which include how to write a novel, how to write nonfiction, productivity, business plan, online courses, multiple streams of income, content marketing for fiction and co-writing a book. And so you can do all of that if you like. And of course, I have a course on how to turn what into an online course. Now, I think 
online courses are in really becoming more and more important. And if you're if you don't have one already, there's certainly something to consider if you're building an author platform, whether fiction or nonfiction. I'm certainly thinking about that around what I could do with books and travel, for example, how to plan uh, a multi day walking trip, that type of thing. I, I think it's just people are looking for online education as well as entertainment, inspiration. And you can offer that certainly if you have a book, then there's definitely ways to turn that book into a course and vice versa. My personal update this week. <laughs> what can I say? I think we, Jonathan and I just came back from a walk and we were talking about how we feel pretty down actually this week. And I think what it is, it's probably we all hoped the end of 2020 meant that the beginning of 2021 would be somehow miraculously better. But of course, practically the virus doesn't know that it's a new year and clearly there are some political shenanigans going on in the US and a whole load of other things that make it not as exciting in the first week of January as we hoped. We hoped for this new dawn of a new year. I certainly do. I always feel that I feel quite negative at the end of a year and I just love the beginning of a new year. It just feels great to turn the page and start again but equally being back in lockdown in the cold dark weather here in the UK and it just feels like definitely Groundhog Day in a sort of not brilliant way and even we have so many wonderful things in the world and I am very grateful for all of those things. I think you'll agree there's a sort of there's a lot of feelings. Feel the feelings everyone. (laughs) Just Anyway, we both did decided that we would do dry January and Jonathan lasted about 48 hours and I lasted until around the 5th, (laughs) the 5th of January. Good on me. Managed five days. And uh, yeah, so I think it's not the time to be giving up wine and gin, certainly in my life. And so we all have to find ways to cope with this difficult time. And for me, it is working and walking and uh, yes, a few drinks in the evening. Okay, in terms of writing, I am working super hard on how to make a living with your writing, the third edition. And yeah, it really is quite a reboot. It's quite a, it has quite a lot of extra chapters in now. There are more ways to make money than ever with your writing, which is great. So I'm delving into those and I'm intending to have that out in March. I'm going to have the pre-order up by the beginning of February once I have all my timing. So that is my next big project. Thanks to everyone for your emails and tweets and comments and YouTube comments and everything. Thanks to Chad, who said, after experiencing some numbness in my left hand while typing along with neck pain, I set up an ergonomic writing space. And Chad sent a great picture and said, I probably wouldn't have thought about this if you didn't talk about writers taking care of themselves so often on the podcast. So thank you. So that's great, Chad. And yes, if you are experiencing any kind of I think numbness and sort of pins and needles or persistent pain, you you just, <laughs> you can't ignore it. You have to start sorting it out, especially as you get older. <laughs> like I'm coming up, so this year I am 46. And so I'm like, there are lots of things that you can't ignore as you get older, like these niggly pains turn into something else. So yeah, definitely listen to your body, especially in these difficult times. Thanks to Daniel, who sent a picture while listening to Mental Models for Writers with Michael Laron on the move. I don't know if it was a bus or a taxi, but a mindset can definitely make the difference between success and failure in your author journey. And then thanks to Joel Davila, who sent a gorgeous picture from Puerto Rico, gorgeous blue sky and blue sea and palm trees and made me feel quite jealous here in Bath as I look out. It's below freezing today. (laughs) It's really cold and dark. I do have one of these lights, a Lumi, L-U-M-I-E, Lumi light, which I have every morning to try and it's like a sort of it's a mental health exercise around light, which you've got to do what you can. And finally, Zoe Sadler says, catching up on the podcast, just wanted to say I still have a tape player in my car from the 1970s and sent a picture of her yellow car with the tape deck there, which is pretty cool. <laughs> 
So today's show is sponsored by Draft to Digital. And of course, you can get into Draft to Digital to library services. Like I mentioned earlier, library services could be even more important digitally as we go forward. And getting your ebooks in, into libraries and through Draft to Digital is certainly a way forward. And you can get audio books in with Findaway, which are a partner with Draft to Digital. And you can certainly work with Draft to Digital to go through to Findaway. And also, they'll obviously get you into loads of other retailers and they're committed to helping independent authors with lots of useful tools i highly recommend draft to digital and i will play a word from the lev- lovely kevin tomlinson in a minute So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing but my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons Thanks to new patrons this week, Jessica Renwick, Sharon Markacheff, Kelly Power, Laura Von Holt, Joshua Walls and Matthew Allen. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for years now. I really appreciate your support. And you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio, which I'll, I guess I'll be recording either this week or the following week for January. You get to ask your questions and I'm super honest and you get behind the scenes stuff and you can support the show at patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen here's a word from draft to digital and then we'll get into the interview hey this is kevin tomlinson with draft to digital so if you've ever co-authored a book or tried to build a box set you know the biggest pain is how to split up the royalties that's why we at draft to digital have built d2d payment splitting We've made it easy for you to share payments with other collaborators on your projects in whatever percentages you prefer. Right from the setup of your book, you can invite participants, agree on who gets paid what, and go. DDD takes care of all those pesky details like tax interviews and making sure everyone gets paid on time. And of course, you continue to own the rights to your work. So, get started on your collaborative project now at drafttodigital.com. We've made it easy for you. See you there. Kate Champion is the author of Never Too Late and Starting Out or Starting Over, as well as a licensed mental health professional who works with anxiety, loss, trauma, with a focus on sustainable wellness and overcoming limiting beliefs. So welcome to the show, Kate. Hello, how are you today? I am great. Now, just start by telling us a bit more about you and how your writing fits alongside this day job that you love. I'm in my mid-50s and I am a licensed mental health professional and have been in practice for, you know, 15 plus years. And it's a, you know, career or something I love and in so much and it's just been a huge part of my journey. But within that journey, obviously, there's been lots of schooling and master's degrees and things like that. And then started out in community mental health with people that have addictions and also mental health concerns. Over the time, I've written a lot through school. I've worked on ECs and I've had a couple of academic journal articles published. But I've never really considered myself kind of a writer, writer. But, you know, as my kind of career advanced, I really was drawn to anxiety and helping people manage limiting beliefs and sustainable wellness. Those kind of two paths began to emerge uh, or merge and got to a stage about mm, three years ago when I was really questioning my role in um, community mental health, worked for a big local healthcare company kind of going up the ladder with regard to management positions and leadership and yada, 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 but I just wasn't feeling it and took about a year to soul search and eventually kind of my path switched to full-time private practice. And also that's when the author piece came in and really trying to pull those threads in with regard to helping people with mental health, the mental health piece, but also the sustainable wellness. And I am also, I consider myself an athlete. So I'm out a lot, hiking, backpacking, running, trail running. I'm trying to be as well as I can be, which is good in times like this. So really bringing those two threads together. And that's when I had my idea for my first book. 
Fantastic. Now, I've got two questions out of this before we get back okay. to what's, what's in the book. So first of all, I mean, mental health, <laughs> we're recording this at the end of the pandemic year 2020, although this will go out in the new year. But mental health has been a big challenge for a lot of people during this time for very understandable reasons, you know, on top of any other life situations that might be going on. So I wondered what were your thoughts on using writing as an individual to actually help with mental health? I mean, personally, whatever I'm feeling, I write, I have my journals, I journal things, and I read, might read them later and be like, I, I just don't even recognize that person. But I was able to get that out from my head onto the page. It's always been a tool for me. I haven't necessarily had a therapist or anything, but I've always written. So what are your thoughts on people who are struggling using writing to help that is a great question. And yes, this year, I cannot tell you any, anybody who had any kind of underlying anything, the heat has really been cranked up on things like depression, anxiety, relationship struggles. So if you are struggling out there, it's okay. Everybody is struggling. But with regard to kind of writing on a personal note, I have also journaled a lot. Not so much, I'm not a regular journal, but I really do use the written word to process thoughts and feelings and transitions in life. Getting those words on the page is very therapeutic. And there are some studies, there's some research behind what we call narrative therapy, which is literally you know, telling your story through the written word and then processing it through with somebody and then really looking at it and picking out things, maybe the thinking errors or the limiting beliefs or trying to see things that you really resonate with and things, you know, just because we write something doesn't mean it's true. Just because we haven't a thought doesn't mean it's a fact. It's a great way to reflect. And also, I think what's really cool about kind of writing and journaling on a personal level or to work through something is that you can look back, right? I mean, you can go back to two years ago or three years ago or four years ago. I go back to my master's degree journaling and I see what I was writing then, where my head and heart were today is very different. So you can really, it's a great way to also track growth. And I think it's hopeful, kind of hope it brings hope. Yeah, definitely. I read some of my, particularly I went through a, a divorce and uh, those years I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I've moved on from that level of pain at that point. But it's almost like when you write it down, you can revisit it later and it can help with your writing now. And as you say, recognizing those transition points. I also wanted to, you mentioned there about moving into private practice and mm. that was the point when you decided to write a book. So on a business level, because of course, a lot of people listening might be thinking about writing nonfiction. How does how do your books play a part in your practice and uh, whether that's content marketing or blogging or the books themselves? So can writing also be marketing for private practice? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I had this kind of desire to write a, some kind of a book, I actually wanted to write a more of a clinical book, really around anxiety, kind of working through limiting beliefs, more of a, self, a self-help self that wasn't super clinical, but was good for the everyday person, kind of speaking the language of the everyday person. Yeah, I started, I've started, I've started a grief book. I've started a book about anxiety. I have like five books started already in that kind of genre or, or with those threads and honestly I couldn't get through them because I didn't feel this is going to be odd I didn't really feel like I had the kind of clinical chops to really put my name out there and say hey I'm this expert on this or that even though I, I am right I've got over 10 years of practice and blah 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 so my books now again for me this has been like um a journey that's just evolved very naturally. So my books now are very focused on sustainable wellness, overcoming limiting beliefs, and really getting out there as an individual, whether it's writing or walking or hiking or backpacking, really shining the spotlight on people of regardless of age or ability, doing some really amazing things. And that is tied in with things like, okay, people struggle with motivation, kind of how can you help with that? We all have limiting beliefs. How can you work through those? So it's tying those two threads together. So the little sprinkle of the mental health stuff on along with just the everyday sustainable wellness 
those are the threads that are coming together right now. And it's been a blast. It really has. Mm. Well, I think that's great for people to hear as well, because I also think sometimes it's not the thing that you should write. I mean, you should, in inverted commas, write a book to support your practice, but that's not what is bringing you alive in terms of your writing. So it's obviously a completely different thing for you, which is also something to recognise. So that's encouraging to people. If the book you're trying to write is not working out very well, <laughs> then write something else. It's not don't You don't have to force yourself into writing the thing that you should write you have to do the thing that makes you come alive I mean otherwise I think we've learned that in the pandemic year right life is too short <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and it's being intentional right it's really it's it's part part of that personal growth about okay I was waking up in the morning and dropping that question into the system okay what do I really want to work on today what do I really want to write what do I really want to focus on what do I really want to work on and just allowing that to emerge and I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that and I know those grief and anxiety books will be written but again this is kind of where my heart is right now and I wouldn't again wouldn't change it Absolutely. So let's talk about the book. So Never Too Late is is fantastic. Many people come to writing later in life. I mean, you mentioned you're in your 50s. My mum started writing uh, when she hit 70. And I get emails all the time. People say, is it too late to start writing? So whether it's writing or fitness or any of the things you talk about, how can you encourage people to get started, even if they feel it might be too late? Yeah, so I would say if you have some kind of belief around it's too late, that's probably a belief that's limiting you. And I would check under the hood and see what that's about. Because truthfully, we have this life. And as long as we're alive and kicking and breathing, we know we have the ability to do things, whatever it is. If it's athletics, when you're just starting out and it's a walk to the mailbox back or around the block, just start there. If it's a book you're trying to hatch, then just kind of sit your rear end down and just try and just make some notes and brainstorm. And it just is really, it is never too late. And the only time it is too late is really when we're six feet under. I mean, <laughs> I really believe, I really in my heart of hearts believe that. And if you look, there are so many incredible people at incredible ages doing some incredible things. And that is really what Never Too Late is about. It is shining the spotlight on some very, and I'm air quotes, ordinary, inspirational people that are doing some incredible things in later in life in their 60s and 70s and 80s. I mean, it's just the real limit. We are limitless. And that's another book in the series, but we are limitless. And if you're struggling with that, then you might have some beliefs that you have to work through. So what what are some of those beliefs? I mean, I'm thinking that one belief is a societal belief that we are, in quotes, useless after a certain age, thus retirement, thus things that we're almost told in our culture, but are changing, I think, uh, these days. Uh, I mean, I remember both my grandparents died in their 70s of lung cancer, and they were old in their 70s. Mm-hmm. But my mom is now like 73 and last year before the pandemic, she went on the Silk Road. You know, she was traveling in Uzbekistan and I didn't think of her as old. And I I wonder if it's this real cultural issue with saying that people over a certain age have to behave in a certain way. I mean, is that something that's so deeply embedded? Yeah, I think you have a that is a great point. I do think we have a deep societal, cultural Stigma. I mean, that's really the word we're looking at here. We have some stigma around age and aging and ageism. Right now in, in the time that we're living in, I think a lot of that, those stigmas are kind of be- beginning to be reduced. I think especially in the baby boomer generation, I think they have done a lot to say, okay, we can reinvent, we can continue to innovate, we can continue to retire and have this second or third or fourth career. Again, it comes back to those these athletes that I've been um, working with and, and talking to. They do not get up in the morning and think I'm too old, right? They just don't. They just don't. That's not part of their lexicon with regard to their thought process. They get up and they get their shoes on. They get out for that run or that hike or whatever. I do feel like we have some conditioning to undo, but we can blame lots of things on culture, right? But ultimately, we're the people that are 
getting up and every day and kind of being intentional about our lives. I think being mindful, maybe some, again, some reflective journaling around what do I really think about age? What has my culture taught me about age? And what, what, what do I like about that? And what can I change about that? It's really being reflective and, and mindful about these external, how's the word, kind of these external constraints that I think are, are put on us often, unfortunately. And then I think there's also a real internal issue. So, and this is not an age thing. I get emails all the time from people younger than me. So I'm 45 and someone will email me and say, I'm not very good with numbers. So I can't learn about how money works as an author, or I'm not Mm -hmm. very technical. So I can't do uh, Amazon KDP. I just need someone to do it for me. Can you do it for me? Or I don't know how to do this. Can you do it for me? And I'm, it drives me a little bit nuts because to me, it has to be a growth mindset. I didn't know any of this stuff either. You didn't know any of this stuff. We, le- we have to learn. And in fact, in this era of digital transformation, we all will have to reskill whatever our age over and over and over again. And I feel like people scared of that or is it because they've been told that you have to stop learning at some point that when you leave school, you stop learning or what do you think of some of these internal issues and how can we embrace that growth mindset? Yeah, I think that's another great question. I think it's fear of the unknown. I think it's fear of not knowing. I think it's maybe fear of failure or fear of looking stupid. And again, air quotes here. And I think it's insecurities about what if it's not good enough or I have to be perfect or blah, blah, blah. I think it's people come to the table with that and that's absolutely fine. But again, I would honestly frame those in as limiting beliefs. I mean, you have maybe the fact that you might not be good enough good with money. So maybe that isn't your area of strength, but what is, right? I'm going to use a personal example here. My area of strengths are, I mean, I really like writing and I feel like I can put words on the page. So I focus on the writing. I've really actually struggled with spelling and grammar. I'm a little dyslexic. So that is an area where I know I struggle. So I have made sure that I've built a little team that will help me with the editing. I also really struggled with the formatting, again, because I think it's that dyslexia. So I have a little person I go to and he does my formatting for me, right? So it's really this exercise of using your strengths, really focusing on those, finding out where your limits are, and then getting a little help with that if you can. There's some things I've had to push myself for with regard to technology. I literally, when I started this, I literally had seven Facebook friends. <laughs> I had no social media at all by choice. Two years later, I got Instagram, I got Facebook, I got Facebook groups. I've really had to learn that skill. I think the cool thing about where we are now is you can learn anything, right? I mean, I your courses, for example, your courses have really helped me with regard to learning about the setting up the website. You know, the course has been really helpful. So I looked at that, I learned from that, and I put that in practice. So just go out there, do a Google, Google search. And also, I would say, bring whatever your expectations are, bring them down, get them smaller and smaller. And if Let's use that example of money. If you're not good with money, go jump on and read a research article or or an investment article or start to get informed a little bit. Take five minutes a day and, and just read or watch a video or jump onto YouTube. You'll be amazed how quickly you can develop some skill in a pretty short space of time. I totally agree with you. And I I do actually have a list at the creativepen.com forward slash money books. It's something I'm quite passionate about helping people learn that stuff. Because I think there are some things you mentioned formatting. Who cares if you outsource that? It it is a useful skill, but it's not necessary at all. Whereas something like learning how to deal with money is a necessary life skill. And you can learn that stuff at any age. It's just another language. So, And you mentioned they're getting help with spelling. That's fantastic. I mean, I run all my books through Pro Writing Aid. And we, as you say, we have these tools that help us fill in the gaps. But you also mentioned then you, you said about pushing yourself and you gave the example of social media. This to me 
is very important. I feel that people stay in their comfort zone. Now, of course, your book, Never Too Late, has a lot of stuff about physical comfort zones. So I've done some ultra marathons. You obviously do running and long walks and stuff. And there is some physical discomfort (laughs) phases and we push ourselves. And it's about knowing when you're pushing yourself too much. But if you don't push yourself, you're never going to achieve something. So how do people know where the line is between pushing themselves enough to achieve something and pushing themselves too much so that they fall apart? (laughs) That's a great question. I'm thinking about some of my extended backpacking trips and I can think of a couple of trips where I probably push myself too much, right? When you come home and you can hardly walk and get out of bed for three days, that would be an example of pushing yourself too much. I guess I think everybody has their own personal limits, right? Whether comfortable versus uncomfortable. I actually think it's really important to be uncomfortable. Believe me, I like my creature comforts, but I also think there's value in pushing yourself. The body, the system, the brain starts to feel a little uncomfortable. So for me, that would be this whole social media thing, right? I'm a pretty private person. I don't like all my business out there. So for me, I was had to look at, okay, what am I? I know I had to do it. It was a no-brainer. If I wanted this thing to halfway succeed, I know I'm going to have to have some kind of social media presence in today's age. And I'm an independent author. So if I don't put the book out there, no one's going to be coming knocking on my door. So I started small. I made a little plan, right? I I know that you're working on an author plan. So I made a little plan and I took some very small baby steps. If you take little micro steps and you bit like little building blocks, like little Legos, right? So the first thing I would learn a little bit about websites and Facebook. And the second thing is, okay, what is my audience? Who do I want to attract? The third thing would be, okay, let's put some language together and let's just put up a page. Let's not even launch it. Let's just put up a page with a couple of photos and then let's sit with that and see how that feels. So it's this constant little micro steps with with just checking in with the self. How am I doing with this? Am I comfortable with this? Is this too much? Is it too listen, too little? It's really, again, it's getting inside you and figuring out how the body is doing with this and using yourself, your wise self as that guide. And again, that's that's a very different mindset to what a lot of people do. It's more internally driven than externally. And it's interesting. I think you're right about the baby steps. So you and I have done some pretty long events <laughs> and multi-day walking, things like that. But that's not how you start, right? As you say, no. you start by having a short walk. <laughs> Right. I was tripped to the mailbox in the back. I mean, literally in my book, I talk to people about, you know, motivation. Nobody expects you to run, get out there and run a hundred miles or hike a hundred miles or whatever. You don't start there, right? Nobody, nobody, even like the biggest people, again, air quotes, most successful people in the world. Nobody starts from A and just leaps to Z, right? But I think in our culture, we see, oh, this overnight person did this or that. But that's actually false, right? That is a thinking error because nobody jumps from A to Z. There's every single letter in between and you have to hit every single letter. That is the mindset. That really is the mindset. Baby steps, walk to the mailbox and back or look at a video or read that financial blog, right? It's these baby steps that will over time, you can build on and will over time get you to where your destination is. I like that you call yourself a back of the pack athlete, which I love. And I've actually learned a lot about comparisonitis Mm. for doing these physical events. So like the last Mm -hmm. day ultra I did. And it's so funny because at some points in the journey, you're like, oh, I'm doing so well and I'm walking really fast and I pass all these people and I'm like, wow, I'm really good. And then 10 minutes later, you get overtaken by some one of your runners who's 85 and is running past at triple the speed I could ever move at. And it's like, oh, right. Okay. So really comparing myself in a positive way or a negative way is completely useless because it's very unlikely that I'm going to win a race, a physical race, but I'm not racing against someone else. I'm doing it for myself. So that kind of comparisonitis, is is that something that you think is damaging or actually help us to try and be better? 
Yeah, I actually um, cover that in my l- latest book, The Starting Out and Starting Over. I talk about comparison. Comparison. I talk about the only person that you need to be comparing yourself is you, right? The, your your comp- there's the there's that meme or that that thing out there. Your competition is the one that's staring you in the mirror. It comes down to this this ability to internally reflect and and kind of put your own rudder in the direction where you want it to go based on what your goals are, who you are, your means at the time, and also, again, your culture and beliefs and things like that. Really just comparing yourself to to you and what you're comfortable with is so, so, so important. So important. So important. Mm. Yeah. Give us an example of one of the people in the book, Never Too Late, that you particularly find uh, inspiring. I think they're all inspiring because I chose them all. But I really resonated with the the female long distance endurance hiker. She started hiking at 55. And in the last, now she's in her mid 60s. This woman has hiked and backpacked thousands and thousands and thousands of miles and she's done it all she's done the Appalachian Trail she's done a lot of the Florida to Sea Trail she's done the PCT she's done so many miles by her by herself just solo she get out there she freeze dries her freeze dries her own food she's out there for months literally three or four months at a time just hiking and backpacking and I think the connection, A, she's amazing. She's slighter. She's smaller. She just has this incredible connection with nature and the universe and this quality around her. But absolutely no fear, no limiting beliefs. She is just living her life really on her terms in a kind of wonderfully, I don't want to say spiritual, right? Kind of the spiritual way. And I don't mean that in religion so much, but just just in harmony, right? It's just wonderful. So she's a huge inspiration for me. And I think it's really important as well to have what I would say call mentors. And a lot of, I do get a lot of emails where people say, can you be my mentor? Like, can I be their mentor? And I'm like, mm, I don't actually do that as a person but you mm. can read my books and listen to my podcast <laughs> and and I feel like that lady for you and I have mentors whose books I read like all my mentors are really from books and from podcasts and there's an example there of someone in a sort of physical situation and having mentors who have done things that we want to do is really important for this mindset shift, I think. So when I think about some of my ambitions, I know that if I I look to someone who's already done it, then I know it's possible for someone like me. Because as you said, these are ordinary people and everyone is ordinary, actually. Right, Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And we feel like, oh, but who am I? I'm nothing special. But actually, we're all special and we're all ordinary. And the people who achieve these things are just putting things into practice. So I think that would probably be a tip. Find people who have done the things you want to achieve and then look at how they did it. You know, that woman didn't set off on day one for months. She did her training and put in her time and did a kilometer at a time and all that. So that would probably be something I I would think. Yeah, I agree entirely. And as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, let me give you some examples, right? So you, Joanna Pan, has been a huge mentor unknowingly, right? This is the first time we've talked and connected. I, in the beginning of my author journey, I was a blank slate, blank slate. So I really had to look and listen. I had about five people that I was kind of following and listening to and trying to find that person that made sense to me. Um you know, in the big, the big ones, the yes, SPF podcast and things like that, six figure author, those have all been great. But it is, it's finding those two or three people that you really resonate with that makes sense to you. And honestly, I've had to cut some people out as well, right? So in the beginning, right, you're just trying to, this fire hose of information coming at you. And I had to quiet some of the voices because it was too much, right? It was 
too much static, too much about the money, too much about the comparison, too much about this, that, and the other. So I had to quiet some of the voices and just allow some of the voices and mentors that really resonated with me. And, you know, you have been one of those people. So again, thank you for that. Oh, I appreciate that. And you're exactly right about having to cut out uh, people and really honing down who you want to listen to. I think that it would be another tip for people. Uh, You Mm -hmm. know, you do have to do that. And I know that sometimes people feel the need. I mean, like, for example, I don't listen to many podcasts on writing anymore because I started writing in 2006 and I went through, you go through these stages of what you need to learn and what you need to listen to. And I'm listening to different things now. I'm reading different things now than I was back in 2010, for example. And the same with our physical fitness, right? We're Mm -hmm. learning different things. For example, I learned a very big lesson about changing my socks after my first 50k (laughs) when I did not change my socks enough and now I change my socks every 10 kilometers there are things you have to learn on the journey that sometimes people have told you and you just have to find out for yourself (laughs) yeah I think that's a great point and you do have because we are all wonderfully individual right we are unique we do have to figure out what works for, you have to figure out what works for you, right? Put as an individual. I tend to be a morning writer. My energy is better in the morning. So I'm making sure that I have writing time in the morning. I've tried the writing everyday thing that just does with my private practice. You know, I have these two kind of streams of income. That didn't work with me. So I consider myself a seasonal writer. I figured out, okay, I'm more of a seasonal writer because in the summer, I want to be out like hiking and backpacking. And But in the winter, it's like, okay, it's time to sit down and crack out that next book, you know? And so it's just, again, it's taking this information and it's discerning, right? You're kind of curating your own journey, right? So you've got fire hose of information, you're beginning to discern what fits for you. And then you're taking that and you're really beginning to curate your own kind of life and journey in a way that makes sense to you as an individual. So it's this funnel, you've got this big wide funnel, tons of information and you're boiling down, boiling down, boiling down to like, oh, okay, this actually makes sense to me as a human being. I can do this, right? That's, you know, and you can use that metaphor for anything truthfully right whether it's running or hiking or backpacking or writing or learning about finances right you can (laughs) you can you can use that metaphor all the everything for everything absolutely now you talked a bit about discernment there and right at the beginning you said you went through a period of soul searching and in never too late you say I see life as a series of natural transitions. Now, I think this is another important point because writing fiction, for example, or writing your anxiety book, what might come along at some point, and we have these different transitions. So how do we recognize when we're moving through a transition? And even if sometimes that means leaving behind something we love because we have to make space for what's new, how do you know when that is coming along? That's a really good question. So this whole thing, this whole framework around transition, I don't believe in crises. So in, so I often get people like, again, air quotes in midlife crisis. And one of the first things I'll say to them is like, uh, again, I don't really think this is a midlife crisis. I actually think this is a developmental transitional phase, right? If you think about life, developmentally, there are a, a handful of pivotal transitional phases obviously that birth phase we've got kind of college right now high school into college that that age from about I don't know 16 to 25 that's another big transitional phase we tend to have another transitional phase when we have children if you choose to have children that can be another transitional phase in your life and again that 45-ish to 55-ish right that's generally when those if you have children, they're kind of heading out of the out of the house, and you're hopefully right. You're hopefully you're thinking about okay, what's next for me? Again, that is a transitional phase, and it's recognizing that your energy is changing. Maybe your goals are shifting. Maybe your interests are widening. And again, it's not really this crisis energy. There's nothing wrong. It's just who you are naturally as a human being. Right? We are creatures of change 
you know, creativity is important and lifelong learning is important. And those are the things that make us vibrant as humans. And that is, that is, you know, rest, recognizing and listening to, to that, that may be a transitional time is really important. And that was what's ha- it was exactly what's happening with me, you know, um, just recognizing that 10 years in community mental health and all oh, the benefits were nice and the goal, I could have had the golden handshake and it could have been wonderful, right? If I stayed for another 10 years, but I was recognizing that I was changing, right? And my life was going through a transitional phase and uh, yes, it's scary. And yes, it takes some courage. And yes, I didn't know what was going to happen. But two years later, again, I was, it's literally been a year since I went full-time private practice and two years and yeah and a year since um well never too late came out in june so yeah so in this last year so much change has happened but i have to tell you i am happier and healthier and more vibrant for navigating that transitional phase so yeah just don't be scared right just don't don't be scared it's okay it's okay Mm. and we talked a bit about being uncomfortable and i do think these Mm -hmm. transitions are uncomfortable and like you say people feel uh, uh, I guess that that word crisis I also don't like but there's sort of uncomfortable feelings <laughs> in in that experience and it's funny you mentioned 10 years because I think 10 years in any career if you're mm. changing things up you're going to stagnate and I've certainly been talking about that on this show for a couple of years now I felt like oh I feel like I'm stagnating a bit, but I feel like I've got my mojo back <laughs> recently mm-hmm. looking at the next decade of technolo- technological change and how it's going to impact authors and publishing. Like I, I'm reinvigorated and I'm always going to write, but it's like I always need that next mental challenge and also physical challenge. Obviously, both of us physically challenge ourselves, but definitely mm-hmm. any any change, any shift is going to be uncomfortable. And yet, as you've just said, once you break through that, you're in this new, exciting phase of your life. But inevitably, there'll be some more changes in the future, right? (laughs) Right. So I want to add to that. And let me add to that if I can. It's like the the key is listening to our bodies and brains, right? Our bodies and brains will send us signals that that maybe it's time for a transition. So I'm not particularly prone to anxiety, but I was beginning like around the big, the big girl day job, right? I was beginning to notice that, you know, that pit in the stomach, some tightness in my chest, like the increase of increasing negative thinking around the work and my role. So my body was tell, giving me single signals before I even really realized that, oh, this could be a transitional phase. So really, again, being kind of being dialed in and, and tuned in and your body will tell you, right? Your body will tell you you know, when you're on the right track or not, every time. Mm, Absolutely. Right. So we're almost out of time. So tell people where they can find you and your books online. Yep. So katechampionauthor.com is um, the website. Everything is really available there. Books, um, there's some resources there. There's coaching. If you want some more support with regard to the back of the pack stuff, there's, I have a back of the pack athlete community again you can find that on facebook and then i'm also on instagram as well brilliant well thanks so much for your time kate that was brilliant thank you so much Uh, i've really enjoyed our time and take care so I hope you found the show useful today and that you realise it is never too late to get started. Maybe that's with your writing, maybe it's your fitness, your movement, your health, maybe it's sorting out your marketing this year. So definitely if you want to get into the ads for authors, check out Mark Dawson's course this week and uh, just go to thecreativepen.com forward slash ads to check that out. So next week I have a what I find very exciting interview talking about co-writing with artificial intelligence tools with Yudhanjaya Widjaratni, who is a Sri Lankan author who co-wrote his novel The Salvage Crew with a number of AI tools, including GPT-2. He, he was able to cut his writing time down by several months. He even talks about the joy of co-creating with these tools. And he got a book deal with a traditional publisher. And the audiobook is narrated by Nathan Fillion from Firefly and Castle. If you're a Firefly flan, Firefly flan, 
fan, then you certainly will know Nathan Fillion. And I was like, oh my goodness, he is wonderful. So it's certainly not a, and this was obviously a while ago because this book is out Yuda talks about how he co-created the book, how we can think of co-writing with these tools rather than AI taking our writing jobs. So I find it fascinating and I know you guys will. And it certainly helped really move my own opinion forwards on how I feel about these tools and how I really want to just get using them. So that's coming up. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.